The Defense Department has seen a surge in spending over the last five years. That growth comes along with shifts in acquisition and strategic priorities for the Pentagon. Gregory Sanders is Deputy Director and Fellow for the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Greg, welcome. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. So, as I said, there's been an increase in defense contract obligations for the last five years, 41 percent, which seems substantial. What's causing that? So the low point five years ago was driven by the budget caps. And so sustained budget increases have been the biggest driver. But we've also seen uh, some increases due to foreign military sales that use the U.S. acquisition system but have international funders. So we've uh, talked on this program about uh, other transaction authority or OTA mm -hmm. agreements. Um, what's been their role in conducting, um, in improving defense research and development, and what trends have you seen? So they bring more flexibility. They can work with consortiums that include non-traditional vendors. So more Silicon Valley or startups uh, might be some examples there, but they're also spreading to places like Austin. Um, so they're actually up 122% in just one year. That was driven largely by COVID-19 response from the U.S. federal government. But the larger emphasis on prototyping has really helped change how we do research and development. Have you seen that as a positive? Is that, I mean, do you welcome that increase? Greater adaptability um, and the bringing in new vendors is important and welcome. That said, OTA does have less transparency. And so it's going to be important to balance the benefits it brings and the ability to conduct oversight. So do you think that that increase, though, in OTAs has increased the focus on research and development within the Defense Department? So overall contracting in traditional contracting is actually down slightly. So it has slightly increased. Um, it has allowed for sustained funding in R&D, but otherwise would have been constrained by those decreases. So I'd say yes, but it's in part a supplanting rather than a full-on addition to a traditional R&D. So where have the biggest increases in expenditures been? What have, what have you been seeing? So aircraft and ships and submarines and construction have actually had the largest dollar increases. But in percentage terms, missile defense is up 29 percent. And over the longer period, uh, missiles and ordnance is up uh, 95 percent. That's over five years. So what do you think that says about defense uh, priorities? So some of it is driven by you know, air and missile defense and ordinance and missiles are both directly in line with the national defense strategy. The other um, areas I mentioned in part reflect buying major products from the big five primes and also a little bit of uh, wall funding. Um, so we are seeing the shift to the Indo-PACOM but we aren't quite seeing the shift to full on high technology because C4ISR and space have not seen the major jumps you might expect. So uh, I, I guess that's what I wanted to ask is, is, do shifts in funding always correlate to shifts in strategies and priorities? There is a real lag. So our past research have found that often a shift in priority can take two years to show up in acquisition spending. And particularly when talking major defense acquisition projects that have you know, decade-long lifespans. You know, the F-35 was a major driver of many of the trends I've described today already. So they do show up, but it takes time, and it requires hard choices that were not always made during this period. Are you foreseeing any major spending shifts coming up, um, you know, in this fiscal year or in the next? So we presumably will see the drop-off in a wall funding, but otherwise, what, what drop-off are you talking about? Oh, so there's a jump in construction spending in New Mexico and Arizona that I think we'll probably see dropping down because that was probably for the border wall. But in larger terms, you know, the F-35 is still going to be a major driver. Things like Virginia-class submarines are going to stay there. So we're going to see dramatic shifts. What we might see is some changes in acquisition priorities will have longer um, results. What are you seeing in uh, changes or reforms to the acquisition process itself? So there were a variety of reforms emphasizing flexibility and speed over the last five years. So the Adaptive Acquisition Framework, DIU, um, and things like the Air Force's Pitch Day. So those have made a difference in small concentrated cases, but they have not increased the total number of vendors, which has actually dropped some. So I think there's going to be a continued emphasis on bringing in new vendors. I mean, there's a new OMB memo that emphasizes that. 
um, and continued emphasis on high technology, but not always such an emphasis that really redirects the major funding. So what are you what are you expecting for not just the near term but for the long term as far as defense spending goes? So we might be at a peak or relative peak for obligations. I think they'll probably stay relatively high, but I don't think we're going to see the sustained growth of recent years. We might also see a little bit of a change in um, merger and acquisition policy as the Biden administration has been more skeptical of hyper consolidation as they have mentioned uh, in fears whereas the Trump administration largely tried to follow the market forces as they saw them. All right. Well, Greg, thank you very much for your work and for coming in. Thank you for the chance to speak.